Welcome to the fourth tutorial on dynamic system modeling and control. This tutorial is going to cover uh, building state space models. Specifically, we're going to talk about two things. Number one, we're going to develop a framework for uh, modeling um, dynamic systems in the state space. And number two, we're going to apply this framework to simple translational mechanical systems. Once again, my name is Hossam Fathi, and I'm happy to have you on this tutorial with me. So, as I mentioned, the goals of the tutorial are twofold. Number one, we're going to outline a process for building state space models of dynamic systems. And number two, we're going to apply this process to simple translational mechanical systems. Before we dive into that, I want to go back to the previous tutorial and uh, recall the uh, state space representation of system dynamics. So, if you remember, uh, the state space representation consists of two equations, an equation of the form x dot is some function f of x and u and perhaps time, and an equation of the form y is some function g of x and u and perhaps time. The first set of equations is called the set of state equations, and the second set of equations is called the set of output equations. In these equations, the vector u of t represents the vector of inputs to the dynamic system we're interested in. The vector y represents the set of outputs of the dynamic system we're interested in x of t represents the state of the dynamic system, the memory of the dynamic system, its recollection of the past, and so x of t is a vector of state variables. The function f of uh, x and u is called the state function, and the equation x dot is equal to f of x and u is called the state equation. What it does is it relates the time derivative of the states um, to the values of the states and the values of the inputs at a given instant in time. And finally, the function g is the output function, and the equation y is equal to g of x and u is the output equation. It relates the output of the dynamic system uh, at any given instant in time to its states and inputs at that instant in time. Uh, collectively, these five equations are called the state space, rep or these uh, three definitions and two equations are called the state space representation of a dynamic system. Uh, one small note of apology here in the previous um, tutorial. I had uh, f and f instead of f and g, so there was a small typo. The output function is g of x and u. So what I want to do is I want to take this slide as is and use it to develop a process for modeling dynamic systems using the state space representation. There's nothing particularly sacred about this project uh, process. Um, it's just a pedagogical tool. It's just my way of developing a systematic step-by-step -step approach for developing state-space models. So I'm going to take the slide as is and just change its title from the state-space representation to the state-space modeling process. And essentially, if you look at the slide, developing a state-space model of a dynamic system comes down to two steps, boils down to, two, to five steps. Um, the first step is to identify the input variables for your dynamic system. And there are two types of input variables, as we've discussed before. Control inputs, inputs that you as a control engineer can tap into and exercise and impose on the system, and exogenous inputs that are imposed by an external environment on the system. So you need to decide what exogenous inputs, what disturbances are critical, um, and you need to incorporate those in your vector of input variables. When you pick control inputs, the way you apply a control input to a dynamic system is through an actuator. To a very large extent, the process of control input selection is therefore a, an actuator selection decision. And actuator selection decisions are governed by a number of factors, one of which is cost. How much are you willing to pay for the set of actuators attached to the system? Do you really need actuators 1, 2, 3, and 4, or can you get away with only two of them? Okay, So that step requires a little bit of thought the inputs to a dynamic system are not given now that when you know the dynamic system. You need to think about how you want to actuate the system and what the major disturbances acting on it are. The second step is you pick the output variables. Now just like input variables come in two flavors, output variables also come in two flavors. There are outputs that you measure as a control engineer and use to control the dynamic system. And uh, you measure these through sensors, and so the process of selecting these output variables is essentially a process of selecting sensors. And again, cost becomes a big factor there. Do you really want to measure these five quantities when you can only when you can get away with measuring only three? And so, sensor package selection is a critical uh, is a critical decision that you need to make as you identify output variables. Now, sometimes when we model dynamic systems, we choose the output variables 
to represent performance variables that we may or may not be measuring using sensors, but they are things that we want to simulate and they're things that we want to see as an output of the simulation. So we call them an output variable just because we want to be able to simulate them. We want to see how they behave in a simulation model of the dynamic system. So that's another type of output variables and that's another legitimate way to pick output variables when you're developing a dynamic system model. The third step in developing a dynamic system model is to identify the state or memory variables. I'm going to stop here and not talk much more about the identification of state variables because that will be a much bigger topic in a couple of slides. So for now, let's just say that the third step is going to be identification of state variables. The fourth step is to use the laws of physics, for example, the laws of continuity, Newton's law of motion, etc., to relate the derivatives of the states, x dot, to the states and the inputs. In other words, to write the state equations. And then the final step is again to use the laws of physics, again Newton's law of motion, um, or actually in this case more the laws of continuity than, than the laws of motion, although sometimes you will find yourself using the laws of motion, to relate the output variables to the state and the inputs, the states and the inputs of the dynamic system. In other words, to write out the output equation and to say y is equal to g of x and u. There's nothing sacred about this process. It doesn't have to proceed uh, in the five steps that I've outlined here. They don't have to be in this order. But what I'm trying to do here is to throw something a little more systematic at you than just to say, well, come up with a state-space model however you want to come up with it. I want to throw a little more structure into the process purely for pedagogical reasons. Now, the next thing I want to do is to illustrate this process on an example. And I want this example to be a translational mechanical systems example because that's the next topic we're going to dive into. And uh, one thing that is um, important in this context um, is that we haven't really answered the question of how do we identify state variables. So I want to think a little hard with you about what it means to identify the state variables specifically for a mechanical system. Now, this is going to be a little bit of a philosophical discussion, but it's a very important philosophical discussion. What I want to think about here is the set of goals for this tutorial. Number one, to outline a state-space modeling process, and number two, to illustrate this process for translational mechanical systems. I want to think a little harder about illustrating this process for translational mechanical systems, and specifically, I want to think a little harder with you about what it means for a mechanical system to have memory. What do the states of a mechanical system represent. Well, if you think about it, every mechanical system is an energetic system. An energetic system is a system that stores energy, releases energy, dissipates energy, etc. And if you think about an energetic system and how it remembers the past, the wishing well in the example from a couple of tutorials ago remembered the past by storing a certain amount of money and the accumulated money was its memory of the past. A mechanical system remembers the past by storing energy, and the accumulated energy is its memory of the past. So systems that are mechanical systems remember the past by storing energy. And what this means is that the state variables of a mechanical system should reflect the amount of energy stored in a mechanical system. Let's take a, s a few simple examples here. Let's think about a mass that is moving in space at a certain velocity. The kinetic energy of that mass in some ways is its recollection of the past. As this mass underwent motion, it uh, experienced forces that caused it to accelerate and decelerate. Work was done on the mass, work was done by the mass, and eventually the accumulation of all this, the culmination of all of this is that the mass stored a certain amount of energy over the history of time. And this kinetic energy is equal to one-half times the mass times velocity squared. It makes sense to pick a state variable that reflects this kinetic energy, to think of the kinetic energy as the memory of the mass. Now, there are many legitimate choices of state variables here, and not one of them is, you know, the ultimate choice or the only choice or the correct choice. You could decide to make kinetic energy the state variable for this mass, but it's a bit more common, much more common, as a matter of fact, to look at kinetic energy and say, well, it's equal to one-half times the mass, times velocity squared, so one way, one other way to remember the mass's kinetic energy, one other way to define the state of the mass is to pick velocity as a state variable, okay? So when you're modeling a mass and its motion, 
it is very typical in the dynamic systems world to use the velocity of the mass as a state variable. Let's take another example. Suppose we look at a spring, a linear spring. The elastic energy stored in the spring is one half times stiffness times deflection squared, one half kx squared. So the energy stored in the spring is its recollection of the past. One way to represent the energy stored in the spring is to say, well, my state variable is going to be deflection. Let's go back to the mass, but now assume that the mass is storing energy not so much by moving at a certain velocity and having kinetic energy, but by climbing up and down in a gravitational field. And let's assume a constant gravitational field. So the gravity constant g is, is a number. It doesn't change with elevation. And, um, and so the amount of potential energy that the mass stores is equal to the mass times gravity times height, mgh. Mass is constant, gravity is constant in this case. And so what we can do is we can use the height of the mass as its state variable, as a representation of the amount of energy it contains. In all of these examples, what we're doing is we're taking mechani simple mechanical components, not even systems. We're asking ourselves the question, how do they store energy? And then we're using that question to pick a state variable that represents the, the component's memory of the past. Now, of course, a mechanical system contains many components. And some of these components are going to be coupled to one another. So, for example, you can have a, a, a mechanism that contains multiple rigid bodies in one part of it, at least, that are just rigidly bolted to one another. If you think of each one of these rigid bodies as a mass, and you think of its velocity as a state variable, you're going to be using the same velocity over and over and over again as a state variable, which is somewhat redundant. And we don't want our state variables to be redundant. So the last thing that we need to think about is that the overall number of state variables for a, a mechanical system should ideally equal the number of independent energy storage modes. Okay, So when we pick state variables for a translational mechanical systems, we are going to look at the number of independent ways in which they can store energy, and we're going to use that to pick state variables. With this preamble in mind, I want to move to an example. And the example I want to move to is an example of a loudspeaker. And I want a very simple loudspeaker example. So I want you to think about a very, very cheap um, do-it-yourself uh, science project you're going to do in your uh, garage in your free time where you build your own loudspeaker from scratch. You essentially wire up an electric circuit so that the electric circuit has inductance in it and is able to generate a magnetic field. The magnetic field acts on a diaphragm and causes it to deflect. And as you uh, vary the current in the circuit, the diaphragm's reflection, deflection changes with time. And as a result, you get vibrations and you get, you're able to generate sound. Let's think of something that simple. I want to model the vibrations of this diaphragm under the influence of the force from the electric circuit. I want to build that model and I want to build it in state space form. So the first thing I want to do is I just want to sketch the system that we're looking at. There's obviously the diaphragm and we can model the diaphragm as a plate with an infinite number of little masses and little springs attached to one another. But remember in this uh, set of tutorials we're more interested in simpler, perhaps not necessarily as accurate, lumped parameter models. And so I'm going to lump the whole mass of the diaphragm into a single block of mass m. And then I'm going to say, well, this diaphragm is elastic, and so it has stiffness. So this mass is attached to a spring of stiffness k. There is damping from aerodynamic friction effects and from other friction effects. And so I'm going to pretend that there's a damper. And I'm, uh, for simplicity, I'm going to even make it linear and give it a damping coefficient c. The spring and damper connect the mass to uh, you know, a, a platform or a base that I'm going to assume is not moving. And so I'm going to have a non-moving ground, an inertial ground that, these, uh, that this mass spring damper assembly is connected to. The electric circuit applies a force on the mass. And so I'm just going to draw an arrow representing that force. So now I want to build a state space model of the system. Okay, Remember, a system, if you go back a couple of tutorials, a system is something that has a well-defined boundary. Everything inside this boundary is the system. Everything outside this boundary is the environment. And I need to be careful about where this boundary lies because my loudspeaker contains an electric circuit. And there's a question that we need to ask ourselves. Is this electric circuit part of the system or is it part of the environment? There's no correct or incorrect answer. You can incorporate the electric, system with, uh, electric circuit within the system or within the environment depending on what your modeling goal is. 
here our goal is to go through as simple an example as possible. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw my boundary of the system um, around the mechanical components only. And I'm going to pretend that the electrical circuit lies outside the mechanical components and is therefore part of the environment. So I am not going to be incorporating within my system the elements of the electric circuit. Okay. With that in mind, let's go through the five-step process. First step is to identify input variables. And there are two kinds of input variables, control inputs and exogenous inputs. I'm going to ignore exogenous inputs for simplicity in this example, and I'm going to focus on control inputs, my actuators. The main actuator I have in this case is the electric circuit, which applies a force on the mass. So I'm going to say that my input, U of T, remember that's the symbol for an input, there's only one input, so it's a scalar U of T, and it is applied force, the applied force on the mass. The next step is to identify the output variables. There are two types of output variables, the sensors and the performance variables. Um, if I'm trying to analyze the performance of this loudspeaker, perhaps I want to see how much the mass M vibrates. Perhaps I want to see how fast it vibrates. Perhaps I want to look at plots and sketches of its velocity as a function of time. So I'm going to pick y of t, velocity of the mass, as my output variable. This is a choice, and in many ways it's a personal choice. As a control engineer and as a dynamic systems engineer, you get to ask the, the curious questions of, well, which input do I really want to consider? Which output do I really want to look at and plot? Excuse me. And so my answer in this context is I would, I would like to see plots of velocity as a function of time, so I'm going to make that my output variable. The third step is to identify state variables. Remember, for a mechanical system, the state variables correspond to the modes of energy storage in the system, and specifically the independent modes of energy storage. If you look at this diagram, you'll see that this system can store energy in two different ways. First of all, it can store elastic potential energy in the spring. And as we've said before, the spring deflection is one good way to represent that in a state space model. And uh, anytime you say spring deflection is a state variable, you need to assign a positive uh, direction. Is it positive intention or compression? I'm going to assume that the spring deflection is positive intention. The second way that this system can store energy is the mass can store kinetic energy. And so it makes sense in this case to make my second state variable, x2 of t, the velocity of the mass. And again, every time I pick a velocity as a state variable, I need to assign a positive direction, and the positive direction in this case is to the right, and that's just an arbitrary decision. Okay? There is no other way that this system, as sketched, can store energy. I'm assuming that the loudspeaker uh, moves in the horizontal direction so that gravity doesn't have an influence, and the damper C only dissipates energy, doesn't store energy. So I only have two means of energy storage, two independent means of energy storage. So I've identified my state variables. The fourth step is to use the laws of physics to relate the state derivatives to these input variables and the state variables. So I need an equation for x1 dot as a function of time and an equation for x2 dot as a function of time. Those are going to be my state equations. x1 dot is the rate of spring deflection with respect to time. It has units of velocity. As a matter of fact, it equals velocity. x1 dot, as a matter of fact, equals x2. And that's my first state equation. Now, the choice of sign makes a big, a big difference here. The fact that the spring deflection is positive in tension and that the velocity of, mass of the mass is positive to the right means that x1 dot is equal to positive x2. If I had changed these choices, x1 dot may be equal to negative x2, depending on what my sign convention is. Now I need an equation for x2 dot. x2 is the velocity of the mass. x2 dot is the acceleration of the mass. I need to calculate the acceleration of the mass using a law of physics. Newton's law of motion comes to my help, and I find that x2 dot acceleration, remember force is equal to mass times acceleration, so acceleration is going to equal the input u, the force input u, minus the forces from the other components on the mass divided by the mass. Now here's where things get interesting. What are the other forces acting on the mass? Well, in order to determine that, I'd like to draw a free body diagram of the mass. So I'd like to look at the diagram that we have here and convert it to a free body diagram. The forces acting on the mass come from the spring and the damper. 
If you look at the damper, it applies a force equal to the damping coefficient multiplied by the velocity of the mass in a direction opposite to the velocity of the mass. If you look at the spring, it applies a force equal to the stiffness multiplied by the deflection of the spring. And because the spring deflects in tension, the force is going to pull the mass to the left because I'm assuming that x1 is a, is a tensile deflection. Now that I've put these two forces on the diagram, notice how the mass is detached from everything else. It's detached from the ground. It's a free body. I have a free body diagram. So now I can do the summation of forces. Now I can say that my acceleration x2 dot is equal to 1 over the mass m multiplied by the input force u minus kx1 minus cx2, which is the summation of forces. I have two state variables, and now I have two state equations. So I'm done with step four. Step five is to use the laws of physics to relate the output variables to the state and input variables. I only have one output variable here, the velocity y of t. I want to relate it to the state variables and the input variables. Well, y of t is the velocity of the mass. x2 of t is also the velocity of the mass. So y of t has to equal x2. If you look at the equations I have in the box here, I have the state variables, their derivatives in terms of the states and the inputs. I have the output variable in terms of the states and the inputs. This is my state space model. And I'm done with this exercise. I've built a state space model of this loudspeaker. Now, what have we done? We've outlined a five step process for developing state space models of dynamic systems. We've illustrated this process for a simple translational mechanical system. And in the, in, in, in the process of doing so, no pun intended, um, what we found is that the state variables for a mechanical system are uh, its essentially velocities of its masses, deflections of its springs, basically variables that represent the energy stored in the mechanical system. Well, this is all nice, but I want to take the state space model and I want to simulate it. One of the goals of dynamic system modeling, remember, if we go all the way back to the first tutorial, is to develop simulation models of dynamic systems. I want to see how different forces affect the motion of this, of this diaphragm. I want to see how well this loudspeaker performs. So I want to build a computer simulation of this dynamic system. That's the goal of the next tutorial, which is going to introduce you to a language called Modelica in which we can construct dynamic system models and then um, simulate them using a variety of tools that are able to understand the Modelica language. Um, so thank you very much for, uh, for uh, watching this tutorial, and I look forward to the next tutorial. Thank you.